wrapped them in fat, a double fold sliced clean and topped with strips of flesh. And the old man burned these over dried split wood, and over the quarters poured out glistening wine while young men at his side held five-pronged forks. Once they had burned the bones and tasted the organs, they cut the rest into pieces, pierced them with spits, roasted them to a turn, and pulled them out of the fire. The work done, the feast laid out, they ate well, and no man's hunger lacked a share of the banquet. When they had put aside desire for food and drink, the young men brimmed the mixing bowls with wine, and tipping the first drops for the god in every cup, they poured full rounds for all. And all day long they appeased the god with song, raising a ringing hymn to the distant archer god who drives away the plague. Those young Achaean warriors singing out his power, and Apollo listened, his great heart warm with joy. Then when the sun went down and night came on, they made their beds and slept by the stern cables. When young dawn with her rose-red fingers shone once more, they set sail for the main encampment of Achaea. The archers sent them a bracing following wind. They stepped the mast, spread white sails wide. The wind hit full and the canvas bellied out. The dark waves blew, foaming up the bow, sang out loud and strong as the ship made way, skimming the white caps, cutting toward her goal. And once offshore of Achaea's vast encampment, they eased her in and hauled the black ship high, far up on the sand, and shored her up with timbers. Then they scattered, each to his own ship. But he raged on, grimly camped by his fast fleet, the royal son of Peleus, the swift runner Achilles. Now he no longer haunted the meeting grounds where men win glory. Now he no longer went to war, but day after day he ground his heart out, waiting there, yearning, always yearning for battle cry and combat. And now as the twelfth dawn after this shone clear, the gods who lived forever marched home to Olympus, all in long Cortez, and so set the arm. And Thetis did not forget the son of Peleus. She broke from the cresting wave of first light, and soaring up to the broad sky and Mount Olympus, found the son of Cronus gazing down on the world, peaks apart from the other gods, and seated high on the top of his crown in the blood of the And crouching down at his feet, quickly grasping his knees with her left hand, her right hand holding him underneath the chin, she prayed to the Lord God Zeus, the son of Cronus. Zeus, Father Zeus, if I ever served you well among the deathless gods with a word or action, bring this prayer to pass. Honor my son Achilles. Doomed to the shortest life of any man on earth. And now the lord of men Agamemnon has disgraced him, seizes and keeps his prize, tears her away himself, the king exalted. Olympian Zeus, your urgings rule the world. Come, grant the Trojans victory after victory till the Achaean armies pay my dear son back, building higher the honor he deserves. She paused, but Zeus who commands the storm clouds answered nothing. The father sat there, silent. It seemed an eternity. But Thetis, clasping his knees, held on, clinging, pressing her question once more. Grant my prayer once and for all, Father. Bow your head in assent. Or deny me outright. What have you to fear? So I may know too well just how cruelly I am the most dishonored goddess of them all. Filled with anger, Zeus, who marshals the storm clouds, answered her at last. Disaster. You will drive me into war with Hera. She with her shrill abuse. Even now, in the face of all the immortal gods, he harries me perpetually. Hera charges me that I always go to battle for the Trojans. Away with you now. Hera might catch us here. I will see to this. I will bring it all to pass. Look, I will bow my head if that will satisfy you. That, I remind you, that among the immortals is the strongest, truest sign I can give. No word or work of mine, nothing can be provoked. There is no treachery, nothing left unfinished, once I bow my head to say it shall be done. I didn't keep you waiting, ladies. So he decreed, and Zeus, the son of Cronus, bowed his craggy dark brows, and the deathless locks came pouring down from the thunderhead of the ring of the giant shock rings spread through all the rings. So the two of them made their pact in heart. Deep in the sea, she drove the radiant mountain. Zeus went back to his own halls, and all the gods in full assembly rose from their seats at once to meet the father strike into a None dared remain at rest as Zeus advanced. They all sprang up to greet him face to face, as he took his place before them on his throne. But Hera knew them all. She had seen how Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter, Thetis quick on her glistening feet, attaching plans to Zeus. And suddenly Hera taunted the father, son of Cronus. So, who of the gods this time, my treacherous one? was hatching plans with you. Always your pleasure whenever my back is turned to settle things in your grand clandestine way. You never deign, do you, freely and frankly, to share your plots with me. Never, not a word. The father of men and gods replied sharply, Hera, stop hoping to fathom all my thoughts. You will find them a trial, though you are my wife. Whatever is right for you to hear, no one, trust me, will know of it before you. Neither God nor man. 
Whatever I choose to plan apart from all the other gods. No more of your everlasting questions. Probe and pry no more. And Hera, the queen, her dark eyes wide, exclaimed, Dread Majesty, son of Cronus, what are you saying? Now surely I've never probed or pried in the past. Why, you can scheme to your heart's content without the form in the world you made. But now, I have a terrible fear she has won you over. Thetis, the old man of the sea's daughter. Thetis with her glistening seat. I know it. Just a dawn, she knelt down beside you and grasped your knees, and I suspect you bowed your head in assent to her. You granted once and for all to exalt Achilles now and slaughter hordes of Achaeans pinned against their ships, and Zeus who marshaled the thunderclouds returned. Maddening one. You and your eternal suspicions. I can never escape you. But tell me, Hera, what can you do about all this? Nothing. Only estrange yourself from me a little more, and all the worse for you. If what you say is true, that must be my pleasure. Now go sit down. Be quiet now. Obey my orders for fear of gods. However many of you are powerless to protect you when I come to throttle you with my existing hands. He subsided in terror of the her eyes wide as terror. She sat in silence. She wrenched her will to his. And throughout the halls of Zeus, the gods of heaven quaked with fear. Hephaestus, the master craftsman, rose up first to harangue them all, trying now to bring his loving mother a little comfort, the white-armed goddess Hera. Oh, disaster. That's what it is. It will be unbearable if the two of you must come to blows this way, flinging the gods in chaos just for mortal men. No more joy for us in the sumptuous feast than riot rule the day. I urge you, mother, you know that I am right. Work back into this good grace, so the father, our beloved father, will never wheel on us again. Send our banquets crashing. Olympian god of lightning, what if he would like to blast us from our seats? He is far too strong. Go back to him, mother. Stroke the father with soft winning words. At once the Olympian will turn kind to us again. Pleading, springing up with a two-handed cup, he reached it toward his loving mother's hands with his own winning words. Patience, mother. Craved as you are, bear up, or dear as you are, I have to see you beaten right before my eyes. I would be shattered. What could I do to save you? It's hard to fight the Olympian strength for strength. You remember the last time I rushed to your defense? He seized my foot, he hurled me off the tremendous threshold, and all day long I dropped. I was dead weight, and then, when the sun went down, down on the to the lemons, with a breath left in me. But the mortals there soon enough to fall in the earth and back to at that, the white-armed goddess Hera smiled and took the cup from her child's hands, then dipping sweet nectar up from the mixing bowl, he poured it round to the and uncontrolled the laughter of the happy god as they watched the god of fire breathing hard and the hall. At that hour then, and all day long, till the sun went down, they feasted, and no god's hunger lacked a share of the handsome banquet, or the gorgeous lyre Apollo struck, or the muses singing voice-to-voice -voice in choirs their vibrant music rising. At last, when the sun's fiery light had set, each immortal went to rest in his own house, the splendid high halls of Feastus built for each, and called his craft on cunning, the famous crooked smith. And Olympian Zeus, the lord of lightning, went to his own beds, where he had always lain when the morning sleep came on him. There he climbed, and there he slept, and by his side lay Hera the queen, the goddess of the golden throne. Book Two, The Great Gathering of Armies now the great array of gods and chariot-driving men slept all night long, but the peaceful grip of sleep could not hold Zeus, turning it over in his mind. How to exalt Achilles? How to slaughter hordes of Achaeans pinned against their ships? As his spirit churned, at last one plan seemed best. He would send a murderous dream to Agamemnon, calling out to the vision, Zeus winged it on. Go, murderous dream, to the fast Achaean ships, and once you reach Agamemnon's shelter, rouse him. Order him, word for word, exactly as I command. Tell Atreides to arm his long-haired Achaeans to attack at once, full force. Now he can take the broad streets of Troy. The immortal gods who hold Olympus clash no more. Hera's appeals have brought them round, and all agree. Greeks are about to crush the men of Troy. At that command, the dream went winging off, and passing quickly along the fast-trimmed ships made for the king, and found him soon, sound asleep in his tent, with refreshing god sent slumber drift around him. Hovering at his head, the vision rose like Nestor, Neleus' son, 
the chief Agamemnon on Ignos, inspired with Nestor's voice and sent by Zeus, the dream cried out, still asleep Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, that skilled breaker of horses, how can you sleep all night, a man weighed down with duties, your armies turning over their lives to your command, responsibilities so heavy, listen to me, quickly. I bring you a message sent by Zeus a world away, but he has you in his heart. He pities you now. Zeus commands you to arm your long-haired Achaeans, to attack at once, full force. Now you can take the broad streets of Troy. The immortal gods who hold Olympus clash no more. There is appeals have brought them round and all agree. Griefs from Zeus are about to crush the men of Troy. But keep this message firmly in your mind. Remember, let no loss of memory overcome you when the sweet grip of slumber sets you free. With that, the dream departed, leaving him there, his heart racing with hopes that would not come to pass. He thought he would take the city of Priam then, that very day, the fool. How could he know what work the father had in mind? The father, still bent on plaguing the Argives and Trojans both, with wounds and groans in the bloody press of battle. But rousing himself from sleep, the divine voice swirling around him, Atreides sat up, bolt awake, pulled on a soft tunic, linen never worn, and over it threw his flaring battle cape. Under his smooth feet he fastened supple sandals, Across his shoulder slung his silver-studded sword. Then he seized the royal scepter of his father. Its power can never die. And grasping it tightly, off he strode to the ships of Argives, armed in bronze. Now the goddess Dawn climbed up to Olympus heights, declaring the light of day to Zeus and the deathless gods as the king commanded heralds to cry out loud and clear and muster the long-haired Achaeans to full assembly. Their cries rang out, battalions gathered quickly. But first, he called his ranking chiefs to council beside the ship of Nestor, the warlord born in Pylos. Summoning them together there, Atreides set forth his cunning foolproof plan. Hear me, friends. A dream sent by the gods has come to me in sleep. Down through the bracing god-sent night it came, like good Nestor in features, height, and build. The old king himself, and hovering at my head, the dream called me on. Still asleep, Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, that skilled breaker of horses, how can you sleep all night? A man weighed down with duties. Your armies turning over their lives to your command. Responsibilities so heavy. Listen to me, quickly. I bring you a message sent by Zeus a world away, but he has you in his heart. He pities you now. Zeus commands you to arm your long-haired Achaeans, to attack at once, full force. Now you can take the broad streets of Troy. The immortal gods who hold Olympus clash no more. Hera's appeals have brought them round and all agree. Griefs from Zeus are about to crush the men of Troy. But keep this message firmly in your mind. With that, the dream went winging off and soothing sleep released me. Come, see if we can arm the Achaeans for assault. But first, according to time-honored custom, I will test the men with a challenge. Tell them all to crowd the Orlocks, cut and run in their ships. But you take up your battle stations at every point. Command them, hold them back. So much for his plan. Agamemnon took his seat and Nestor rose among them. Noble Nestor, the king of Pylos Sandy Harbor spoke and urged them on with all goodwill. Friends, lords of the Argives, oh my captains, if any other Achaean had told us of this dream, we'd call it false and turn our backs upon it. But look, the man who saw it has every claim to be the best. 
the bravest Achaean we can field. Come, see if we can arm the Achaeans for assault. And out he marched, leading the way from council. The rest sprang to their feet. The sceptered kings obeyed the great field marshal. Rank and file streamed behind and rushed like swarms of bees, pouring out of a rocky hollow, burst on endless burst, bunched in clusters seething over the first spring blooms. Dark hordes swirling into the air, this way, that way. So the many armed platoons from the ships and tents came marching on, close file, along the deep wide beach to crowd the meeting ground. And rumor, Zeus's crier, like wildfire blazing among them, whipped them on. The troops assembled, the meeting grounds shook. The earth groaned and rumbled under the huge weight as soldiers took positions, the whole place in uproar. Nine heralds shouted out, trying to keep some order. Quiet, battalions. Silence. Hear your royal kings. The men were forced to their seats, marshaled into ranks. The shouting died away. Silence. King Agamemnon rose to his feet. Raising high in hand the scepter Hephaestus made with all his strength and skill. Hephaestus gave it to Cronus' son, Father Zeus. And Zeus gave it to Hermes, the giant killing guide. And Hermes gave it to Pelops, that fine charioteer. Pelops gave it to Atreus, marshal of fighting men, who died and passed it on to Thyestes, rich in flocks and he in turn bestowed it on Agamemnon to bear on high as he ruled his many islands and lorded mainland Argos. Now, leaning his weight upon that kingly scepter, Atreides declared his will to all of Achaea's armies. Friends, fighting Danaeans, aids in arms of Ares, Cronus' son has trapped me in madness, blinding ruin. Zeus is a harsh, cruel god. He vowed to me long ago. He bowed his head that I should never embark for home till I had brought the walls of Ilium crashing down. But now I see he only plotted brutal treachery. Now he commands me back to Argos in disgrace. Whole regiments of my men destroyed in battle. So it must please his overweening heart. Who knows?